Sí. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We are going to begin our program with uh, my good friend, colleague, and boss, John Walters. Uh, thank you, Jaime. I just wanted to welcome everyone to the Hudson Institute. I'm a chief operating officer here. Um, uh, we're delighted to have this uh, program with you uh, speaking about the important uh, uh, issues regarding Venezuela. Uh, we are aware that in all too many cases, uh, um, uh, the United States and many who uh, care about uh, the security of our region and our world overlook this important country, the influence and the good and bad forces that can be uh, sustained or, uh, or unleashed here. And I want to thank my, uh, my colleague, Ambassador Darren Bloom, for uh, his continued focus and effort to try to help educate uh, uh, not only uh, my colleagues and Americans generally, but also uh, key policymakers that uh, need to pay more attention here. So I want to thank him on behalf of uh, my colleague, Ken Weinstein, the president who can't be here, but also on behalf of many people who have benefited from his work. And I'll let him uh, proceed with the program. I mean, thank you. On December 6th, Venezuelans will have an opportunity to take their anger out at Maduro at the ballot box as the country plans to hold parliamentary elections. If uh, today's polls are to be believed, the opposition will take control of parliament for the first time in 15 years. But given Maduro's past behavior, one can't help but worry that he won't allow that result to happen. What will be the consequence of whatever occurs on that early December day? What happens if the opposition takes over or doesn't? To help us better understand this situation, we have convened a panel of uh, esteemed experts, the best. I would like to thank them deeply for joining us. Their presence will help clarify what's going on in Venezuela. Uh, our first, in the order that I mentioned them here, they'll, sp they'll, they'll come to the podium to, uh, to deliver their their presentations. First is Aníbal Romero, an old friend, a university professor, and a columnist at El Nacional, one of the leading Venezuelan newspapers. Next we have Don Gustavo Coronel, also a very close friend of mine, a geopolitical consultant and former member of the board of directors of the Venezuelan state company, PDVSA. We also have another old friend, Herbert Torres of Gallup. Mr. Torres is a senior Latin American specialist at the research group. And last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Ruen Perina, a lecturer here in George Washington University. And in the past, he was chief of electoral observation missions of the OAS. I would also like to personally thank the Lindy and Harry Bradley Foundation, whose generosity has made this lecture series possible. And special thanks personally to Rachel Cox and uh, Silvia Webel Martinez, who actually organized this event. Without any, any other ado, I turn the microphone to, you can speak from there or yes. from here, whatever you want. I'll speak from here. Okay. <coughs> Thank you, Jaime. 
and thank you for your invitation. I'm uh, delighted to be here and to share this panel with my good friends, Herbert, Gustavo, and Ruben. And I want to thank you all for uh, being here with us. Jaime specifically asked me to focus on a general overview of uh, the social and political situation in Venezuela these days. And I will do my best to remain within that uh, frame. Please allow me to begin with a personal note. In 1999, it must have been March or April of that year, I um, um, had the visit of an American journalist at my home in Caracas, a journalist from the Los Angeles Times newspaper. He uh, pointed out to me that he was finding it very difficult to uh, meet with somebody who actually didn't like Chavez. I was one of the uh, odd fellows at the time who belonged to that category. And uh, it is uh, to, to me sad to remember that at the time, Chavez had the support of 90% of Venezuelans, the goodwill of millions, which he wasted. Why did he do it? Well, that is a matter for a, a psychologically oriented biographer to deal with. But the fact is that he decided to take Venezuela down the destructive road of uh, so-called 21st century socialism. The end result of that experience is the social condition of Venezuela today, which can be summarized easily in three, four, four words. Deception, disillusionment, frustration, discontent, and anger, which are revealed by what the opinion polls tell us. More than 60% of Venezuelans, perhaps 70%, want, want to vote against the government in the forthcoming December elections. About 70% of Venezuelans want President Maduro to be removed from power, from power preferably through a constitutional uh, referendum. And you, you know, I'm sure, you have read about the scarcity of basic goods, the long lines of Venezuelans searching for food, the mismanagement, the corruption, the polarization of society. I won't dwell on this in detail, but rather talk about how does this social condition translate politically? What, I, what is the impact of this degradation of society? And my colleagues here will expand upon the economic aspect too. How, how does this impact the main political actors 
and which is the nature of these political actors. I like to dispel a misconception if it still exists in this country and perhaps among some persons in this country, in this audience, I'm sorry, concerning the nature of the Venezuelan government. We are not talking about a democratic government respectful of the, law, the rule of law and of human rights. We are talking about a government which has violated and betrayed the fundamental Hobbesian, I'm referring of course to Thomas Hobbes, pact between protection and obedience. That is to say, the pact that binds the citizens and the ruler and which establishes that the ruler, the ruler will protect the citizens in exchange for their obedience. I'm referring, of course, to the obedience due to the law. The Venezuelan government is not a legitimate government. If we do not see this clearly, it becomes very difficult to understand not only what we have seen over the last 17 years, but what, me, what we may yet see in the coming months in Venezuela. This is a government which acts with the audacity that springs from a lack of prudence and which unfortunately is used to expect little or no sanctions from its transgressions. Take for, take for example the recent cases of the Venezuelan government's mm -hmm. actions against Colombia and Guyana, our neighbors to the west and to the east. This was a, a dangerous moment for all involved. It could have left, it could have led to war and as a matter of, of fact, one Venezuelan fighter plane, a Russian Suhoi, uh, came down. Nobody knows what happened. There are rumors that it, have made, it may have been brought down by a Colombian anti-aircraft missile. I don't know. But why did they risk a intensifying conflict with Colombia. They argued that it was a problem having with the smuggling of goods uh, in the, at the border and with the actions of the paramilitary. They always talk about the paramilitary because the FARC guerrillas are their friends, are their allies. In, in my view, they did this mainly because they wanted to test the loyalty of the Venezuelan military. It's my conjecture, among others, because they wanted to establish a state of exception in two areas of the country, the state of Zulia and the state of Táchira, which are very important for the opposition, which are very much anti-government now more than ever, and were now a state of exception 
exists. A state of exception that, by the way, makes it very difficult or almost impossible for opposition candidates to develop their electoral campaigns. But also, uh, the, the case of Guyana is, um, is a little bit different. But again, again, it was a risky move. It was a unnecessarily aggressive and uh, created tensions that mobilized the region and, and which showed that the Venezuelan government can create a lot of trouble. Why, why do they act in this way? Well, among other reasons, because they don't fear any serious consequences. Uh, from their actions. The US government uh, is concerned about Cuba. <clears throat> uh, the current administration wants its Cuban legacy. The, the view regarding Venezuela is that what the US interest there is can be defined with one word, stability. Fair enough, fair enough. Uh, the same happens with President Santos in Colombia. He wants his peace with the FARC guerrillas. And he, he, he will be very careful to respond more forcefully to any uh, uh, aggression on the part of the Venezuelan government. It has a strong point, Maduro's regime. It lacks, <coughs> excuse me, it lacks scruples. And if you lack limitations, life becomes simpler. But it has also a weak point, which is, in my view, its unwillingness to change, which will probably lead them to overreach. As far as the opposition is concerned, it is, it is easy and it is fun to criticize. And I have done it in the past. I don't want to underestimate the efforts of the Venezuelan opposition, which has been fighting in very difficult circumstances for a number of years. It has a strong point. It is united. It is united. And I think they have a program although many people accuse them of not having a vision of the Venezuela they want to create. I think this is a mistake. And my good friend, Gustavo Tarre, who is with us today, wrote uh, some time ago uh, an excellent article clarifying the fact that the Venezuelan opposition's program for change may be may seem simple, but it is extremely important. The restoration of constitutional rule, the liberation of the political prisoners, the recovery of the traditional, noble, and to my mind, beautiful world, uh, beautiful name of our country, the Republic of Venezuela, not the, Ven the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, and the respect for human rights. That is the program of the Venezuelan opposition. A third important actor are the armed forces. 
For good or bad, whether we like it or not, and this has to do with our history and the, and the conditions the country now finds itself in, the, we will need the armed forces, or at least part of them, in any transition away from the despotic regime we now suffer under. It is, it is um, a mistake, I, I'll take only one more minute, it is a mistake to deprecate the armed forces as an institution. I know there is corruption, I know they, ha they have been tainted by some of them, some officers, with the traffic of, with narcotic traffic. I, I know they have been indicted, some of them, by the U US Department of Justice. But I, I wouldn't condemn the institution as a whole. We have seen a war of attrition in Venezuela over the last 17 years taking place. But even war of attrition, even wars of attrition come to an end. We may be nearing not the end of the Venezuelan tragedy, but of the opening up of new possibilities and a new political dynamics according to what happens not only in the elections in December, which I think will take place, and I think the opposition will win, whether the, 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 the victory will be recognized or not is another matter. But in any case, no matter what happens, what I'm sure of, of and I'm finished with this, is that come next December, a new correlation of forces politically will uh, begin in Venezuela, favoring the opposition. Gracias, Gustavo Coronel. Well, uh, good afternoon to all. Uh, I am going to start by giving you good news about Venezuela. Uh, Miguel Cabrera has won the batting title in the American League. <laughs> That's about as far as I can go on the good news. <laughs> I want to talk about the oil industry, the current uh, situation of the oil industry, its uh, outlook, and the impact of the outlook on the Venezuelan national economy. Uh, today, Venezuela is a petro state uh, in decline and a narco state in progress. Uh, there are three main industries in Venezuela today. One is oil, the second one is drug uh, trafficking, and the third one is uh, large-scale contraband of uh, oil and goods going from Venezuela into Colombia. About 65% of Venezuelans are convinced that the army is deeply involved in drug trafficking and uh, contraband in Venezuela. Uh, the Wall Street Journal, you might have read it, uh, spoke about Diosdado Cabello, the number two man in Venezuela, as, uh, as the main drug lord in the country. So this leads to Venezuela having, for example, the fourth worst economic risk uh, in, in the world, be behind uh, Syria, Yemen, and Somalia. Uh, during the last uh, 15 years, uh, oil income in Venezuela has been of the order of uh, uh, $1.3 trillion, and total income in Venezuela has been of the order of $2.5 trillion. About, uh, however, about uh, 500,000 barrels per day of Venezuelan oil are not being produced today as compared to 1998. We have lost about half a million barrels per day 
of oil production. And this is in spite of the fact uh, that uh, Petróleos de Venezuela today has five times more employees. The, uh, the petroleum industry operations are uh, in big disarray. Uh, for example, exploration, which is uh, very important to any oil company, today is practically non-existent in Venezuela. Uh, for example, two oil, uh, drilling, uh, two oil exploration wells were drilled in 2014. Uh, if you compare this to Petrobras, for example, the Petrobras drilled over 100 exploration wells. Uh, production, of course, I, I just said, is uh, low, uh, much lower than in 1998. Refining is uh, operating at uh, two-thirds of capacity, about 66% of, of capacity. And this is due to, to the very poor maintenance in the refineries in Venezuela. If you remember, in 2012, we had a big uh, tragedy in the Amway refinery, which is the second largest uh, in the world. Uh, that the tragedy took 42, 45 lives, actually, and uh, incurred in a loss of uh, over $1 billion, uh, to the extent uh, that uh, the insurance companies have refused to pay for, for the damages because they argue that uh, the damages have been, have been the result of poor maintenance and not the result of, of an accident. Now, in the last two, three years, we, if you remember, we had oil at $100 uh, dollars a barrel. And yet, Petróleos de Venezuela and the government could not make ends meet at $100 dollars a barrel. You can imagine uh, how desperate we, uh, we are in financially, how, how desperate uh, Petróleos de Venezuela is financially at $40, uh, $40 a barrel. The only alternative uh, Petróleos de Venezuela has today to get more money is by increasing the production levels in the Orinoco heavy oil area, uh, which have immense resources. If we, if we produce three million barrels of oil from the Orinoco area, we, we would be producing for the next uh, 300 years. Uh, that gives you a, an idea of how immense these, res these resources are. But, but again, producing more from the Orinoco belt, or that's what they call it, uh, we have at least three main obstacles. Uh, the first one is that the oil, as, uh, as it comes off the ground, is not commercial. Uh, you, have, uh, you have to blend it or to refine it in such a way that it becomes commercial. And uh, in, you refine it in very special refineries, uh, deep conversion refineries. And this government has not built one single of those refineries in the last uh, 15 years. So what they have to do is to import light oil from other countries in order to blend uh, this very heavy oil and to make it commercial. And the economics of doing this are not uh, very, very attractive. So they have a limitation there to what they can do uh, in, in along this way. You have a second obstacle which has to do uh, with the way they are operating. Uh, instead of uh, associating with the uh, technically and managerially competent oil companies like Exxon and, and Conoco and Shell, they decided uh, to associate uh, themselves with, uh, with the Russian companies, China, with the Chinese companies, even with uh, companies from Vietnam and Cuba, and uh, frankly, they don't have uh, the, the technology, they don't have the, man the man managerial capability, uh, and much less they have the capital to, to do this development. And on top of that, they don't trust the government. Uh, the, the government has 60% of all of these companies working in the oil, uh, in the uh, Orinoco area, but they don't have the money to put their own financial uh, investment and, and maintenance requirements. 
So they ask uh, the, the associates to provide uh, the hundred percent of that money, and and the uh, the companies uh, don't 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 want to do it, and they don't want to do it because they don't trust uh, the government, and with good reason, the political stability of this government uh, of this government is very very uncertain. And there is a third problem uh, as well. Uh, the pr the, this one is even worse. There is a global trend nowadays towards the replacement of oil by other sources of, of energy. Uh, you take uh, natural gas, uh, uh, eolic or wind, uh, solar, biofuels, and the trend is going to be uh, irreversible. Uh, we don't know whether it will la oil will be uh, with us for the next uh, 50 years or 60 years, but we know it won't be here with us for the next uh, 300 years. It's going to be replaced pretty soon. And that means that the Orinoco heavy oil, like uh, the bride of the story that uh, stood uh, at the aisle, uh, is not going to be produced. But much of it is going to be left uh, behind in the ground as a stranded assets. In Venezuela, we say, se quedó con los crespos hechos. <laughs> so uh, all of these, uh, uh, these three factors are, uh, are milit uh, militate against uh, the Orinoco heavy oil being uh, developed. And uh, what this means then, with an, with, with an oil industry which is uh, rather stagnant uh, and which has no real future uh, great capacity to produce more, what this means is that we are going to be faced nationally with three problems. One is hyperinflation, economic problems. One is hyperinflation, and we are there already. Uh, Venezuela has 200% uh, inflation this, uh, this month. And Barclay, among other observers, are predicting that the inflation in 2016 will hit 2,000%. Uh, so that's hyperinflation. And the second, the second problem is default. Uh, this year, 2015, Venezuela has been liquidating assets. They have been selling gold. They have been uh, withdrawing money from the inter International Monetary Fund. They, they even have been getting money from Dominican Republic and Jamaica for the debts, uh, which is 40% of what they really owe. They, uh, they, they are getting as much can, uh, cash as they can in a desperate uh, uh, attempt at uh, paying their debts this year. But next year, the deficit is going to be between 15 and $18 billion, and I don't see where that money uh, is going to uh, is going to come from. So, on over o, o, on top of all of this, uh, uh, you have a, a problem, a, a big problem of governance in Venezuela, or, or rather, non-existing governance in, in Venezuela. Corruption is at the historically highest level, and corruption is focused on four main areas of the country. The presidency of Venezuela, uh, political corruption, the military, and drug trafficking, Petróleos de Venezuela giving out contracts to their friends at gross uh, 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 corruption. For example, Derwick Associates, uh, which is a company made up of very young Venezuelans with very good contacts within uh, Petróleos de Venezuela. They have obtained more than $1 billion in contracts, and they don't know how to do them. Uh, they don't know how to do the work. So what they do is that they get the contract, they pass it on to other companies that can do the work, and they pocket an immense amount of money as commissions. Uh, they, they, you, you, if you go to New York, if Trump uh, in Trump, uh, Trump Center, uh, Trump Tower, you can see the apartments they have there already. So they are, they are doing quite well. And, uh, and, and then, of course, finan the finance ministry, which is an expert in money laundering. Uh, they have gone into a high financial fraud by manipulating 
the exchange controls in Venezuela. What they do is that they give money to companies, ghost companies of their friends, which uh, uh, don't import, they, they, give, they give dollars to these companies, but they don't import goods. They, they, they pocket uh, the, the money. In, in conclusion, uh, I don't think mu nothing much can be done about uh, the oil industry in Venezuela. In, in fact, I believe uh, Petróleos de Venezuela as an oil company is beyond uh, redemption. It cannot, be re uh, it cannot be put back together. It will have to be replaced by another model of oil management. Uh, it cannot be abruptly liquidated, of course, uh, but it can be done in a matter of three years. And uh, in parallel, we could develop, under a new government, we could develop a new model of uh, oil management in Venezuela. Uh, in, the, in the political ar arena, I have been trying uh, unsuccessfully of uh, uh, calling uh, friends uh, to, to, be, uh, to form a wider national f opposition front than we have today. What we have today is only part of the civil society uh, in the opposition, the, the, the mood, uh, the so-called mood. Uh, they are doing a reasonably good, good job, uh, but uh, they are far from representing the whole Venezuelan opposition. If we call, if we could form a national front that could be much more aggressive against uh, the Venezuelan government than uh, the MUD uh, has been so far, we could probably force the government out much sooner than it might be the case. Uh, I do feel that uh, the formation of this national front uh, has been long, uh, long overdue. Thank you. All right, I'll use the lector. Well, uh, thank you very much for this invitation. Thank you to the Hudson Institute, to our friend, um, for inviting us to participate in, in this uh, interesting um, conversation. Um, I want to um, start um, talking about this the importance, the significance of this election, upcoming parliamentary election in Venezuela, uh, exactly two uh, months away from today. And I think it's difficult to overstate uh, the importance of those elections. Um, I, I'm, at Gallup, I'm part of, uh, of a situation room where we follow elections around the world. And basically, when there is an election coming, uh, the question we ask ourselves is, uh, what is at stake in that election? And in regular countries, uh, normal functioning countries, we basically would go and say, well, at a stake, there are 150 seats. The opposition may win this number of seats. The government may win that number of seats, etc." I think the election in Venezuela is, is more than that. It's not about seats. In, uh, that can be won by the opposition and can be won by the government. Um, the elections in Venezuela, uh, these upcoming elections in Venezuela, is about a very, uh, what can be a very significant process of transition, the start of a transition, and that's what I uh, pretty much feel inclined to, to think and to see in, in these elections, the start of a transition to a new situation where democracy can be restored in Venezuela and well-being, uh, economic well-being, uh, can be brought back. Um, to me, the importance of that election, the main event is not what is going to happen the day of the election, uh, but is what is a start, has started to happen um, because of those elections what is going to happen that day, and what will happen after the elections. I believe the, those elections um, are unleashing forces that the system in Venezuela, the regime, is not prepared to deal with. I think the regime is in a very precarious equilibrium that cannot withstand the dimension, the implications of that election, 
at least in the way I think they are going to take place. Let's examine why is that the case. Let's talk in the first place about what are some common elements between this, these elections, upcoming elections, and the 12 elections that have taken place in the last 15 years under the Chavista regime. Well, there are common elements. Uh, there are, in particular, political common elements. The opposition in Venezuela will be dealing basically with the same actor, with the same corrupt, fraudulent regime in a war situation. Uh, we'll be dealing with uh, a regime that has fixed the rule of the games every time we have gone to an election to try to produce, or in some cases produce, the outcome they've been trying to get out of those elections. The list of tricks, maneuvers they have used is endless. Uh, gerrymandering, redrawing districts to get um, a larger number of elected representatives, um, changing the rule of the games like last time when after the opposition has selected the candidates, uh, they changed the rule, uh, establishing that 40% of those candidates had to be women and and uh, and then forcing the position to to bas basically rush and, and try to adapt to to that new regulation. We can mention so many different uh, two, uh, tricks and and tools they have used. So that's common. That that has been there before and is still here. Um, as I said before, getting worse. Uh, as their situation becomes uh, weaker, more difficult, more complicated, they use more risky resources, like, for example, uh, uh, the conflict they are being playing with at the borders of Venezuela, with Colombia, and with Guyana. So that's common. But there are some important differences, and this is what I want to emphasize here now. In the political arena, the main difference, or some of the main differences are, first of all, the Chavez dream is dead. The revolutionary dream is dead. It's no longer there. Um, I remember uh, polls we um, had in Venezuela, Gallup, uh, where, where the idea the vision you got from what that population was thinking and feeling was striking. In 2006, for example, in 2006, I remember a poll uh, we did in Venezuela. And for a question we have trying to gauge the well-being of people, <coughs> uh, there is a question that asks uh, ask people uh, the following. It says, imagine a ladder of, with 15 steps, I'm sorry, 11 steps, from 0 to 10, where 0 represent the worst possible life you can be living, and 10 represent the best possible life you can be living. Where are you now? And in 2006, Venezuela was the country with the highest percentage of people in the world saying they were on 10. So they were having the best possible life. The country with the highest percentage, 26%. Those were those years where you read in the media, Venezuelan media, that Venezuela was um, among or, or one of the happiest countries in the world. Um, I remember people in Gallup telling me, wow, what's happening in Venezuela? Uh, we, we have to go there, to move there. <laughs> Still, Maduro is saying that many Colombians are going to Venezuela because they, you know, uh, they, they want a better 
uh, higher quality of life. But the case that the case is that um, it was happening in 2006, even though the economic indicators had started to deteriorate considerably. So Venezuela was a case where there was no correlation between the state of the economy. At that moment, it was, you know, um, not as serious, as critical as it is now, but was started, had started to deteriorate. There was no correlation whatsoever between the economic indicators and the political indicators, uh, the popularity and acceptance of government. And my explanation for that at that moment was the leadership, the vision, the dream of Chavez, his charisma, uh, the hope he was able for some time uh, to, um, uh, to feed into people's uh, minds and, 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 and hearts. Of course, uh, help by a very high uh, oil revenue that allowed him to do uh, what we, we all know, um, one of the most ambitious um, set of social programs at that moment in Venezuela. Uh, so that's no longer there. That's one factor. Chavez himself is no longer there. The, the, the enthusiasm, the, the dream associated to the revolution is dead. In the second place, we have the emergence in Venezuela of a new set of political leaders, opposition leaders in this case, which has created some problems at some times, at, at some points, but which at the end, I believe, is, is a strength. It's a strength uh, having a diversity of, of uh, people, leaders, uh, and, and, and you probably have heard of, of, of the, about their names, uh, some of them um, incarcerated now. But there is um, a panoply of, of leaders from the position there. And the, what I see as the initial recovery of political parties. Um, I've seen the numbers where at least two political parties from the position, uh, Voluntad Popular and Primero Justicia, have gained important ground while the Socialist Party, the official party, has lost it. That has been taking place uh, during all these difficult years, but it's there as a, uh, as a reality and as a base for the opposition um, to move forward and, 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 and to build what, is, what will be required uh, to build part of a new Venezuelan democracy and society. Then there is a new economic reality, and already my colleagues here, Aníbal and Gustavo, have referred to it. Um, there is practically no economic indicator that is not signaling the extreme seriousness of the Venezuelan economic situation. Is uh, you know that we have the probably know that we have the highest inflation rate in the world. Uh, that we are suffering from uh, shortages of all type of goods and, and services, from electricity to food to medicines, um, that we have, um, we are running right now um, a huge uh, fiscal deficit in the order of 20%, that we have the biggest distortion in the foreign exchange market of any country in the world, where the difference between the official exchange rate and the and the uh, black market exchange rate is more than 100 times uh, one to the other, uh, not even Syria, not even Afghanistan, uh, not Iraq, nor Iraq that are in the middle of a war exhibit such extreme distortions. So that economic situation, to the point it has gotten, um, is, is a new situation um, in Venezuela for these upcoming elections. And some resources that have people have been counted on 
uh, like the social programs um, have lost all their value. So for example, I remember, again, in 2009, um, many social programs would provide beneficiaries with amount of $200 for practically doing nothing to many people. And today, those $200 are the equivalent <coughs> of less than $10. So social programs, which were a very important base of support for the government, have lost their value, are not there anymore. So that's, that, that's an important difference, the economic situation. A third difference is the isolation of the government compared to where it was a few years ago. And you just need to look around at the world to look for what have been the major, the most important partners of the government, uh, main supporters. And each one of them is in a different, absolutely completely different situation from what it was uh, a few years ago. You look at Cuba, then in a transition uh, to, uh, to a, a, a new relationship with the United States. You look at uh, Dilma Rousseff uh, fighting uh, for her own job, trying to save her own job, not to be impeached. You look to Argentina and you see uh, Christina Kirchner with elections due in that country October 25th, where most likely uh, the official candidate, Daniel Scioli, uh, is going to win. But even if he wins the election, uh, he comes from a different group within Peronism than Christina Kirchner. And reading some of the statements that he has made in, in the past, you can uh, conclude that he probably is not going to be as close, or wouldn't be as close uh, to this regime, Venezuelan regime, as Christina Kirchner has been. You look at China, that has been a major important financial supporter of the uh, Bolivarian Revolution, and they are having uh, its own problems. So that, for example, uh, many of the uh, big projects, investments in Latin America have been abandoned, or they are not being um, financed uh, the way they were supposed to be initially. Maduro periodically goes to China uh, to uh, try to get some money, and, and very often he comes with less that he has gone for, asking for. And if you look to Russia, which has been another supporter of the Venezuelan regime, well, they are trying to, you know, they have a lot uh, on their plate too, right now, in, uh, seriously involved in the Middle East. So that's another element. Um, that uh, the, the regime uh, is, is facing, is facing uh, their international um, supporters or, or partners are having a very serious problems of their own as well. So what can happen? Well, in December, uh, nobody knows for sure, and it's absolutely uncertain. Um, what may happen um, in December, not even the government um, is, 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 is my uh, bet, has any idea of, of what may come out of it. But as I said before, what is important is that we are in a process, we are in the middle of a political process that will change the situation in which we are now, no matter what the result of those elections are. If, but there is one, I'm sorry, but there is one scenario. If we may not know what's going to happen. We can say probably or be more certain of what surely is not going to happen. What I think is not going to happen is that the opposition is going to win the elections. And that regime is going to accept it as a natural democratic contest that should take place in a democratic country 
and hand power to those who win that election. <coughs> it will be much more difficult than that. If they know, if they become aware, as they are now because all the polls are indicating that the government is going to lose the elections and they differ by anything from 20 to 30 and more percentage point of difference between the opposition and the government. They will try to do everything they can to either sabotage those elections totally or partially, or if, if they can do it, if they can do it, which I think is what the opposition needs to try to do, to make sure that uh, the government is forced into having to hold those elections, and this is one of the main tasks uh, from now until that day, is, is they are forced to have it, is because they have been already politically defeated. And I'm here um, using a thesis of my uh, friend Carlos Blanco, who I think uh, rightly has said that for us, for the position, and I include myself as part of it, to defeat in electoral terms the government, we need to defeat it politically first. It's not that an el electoral outcome is going to produce uh, the defeat of the government, but is that we first have to defeat them politically, and then once defeated, they will have to accept the electoral result of that election. It means moving all forces available to the opposition. Be ready for that scenario in which the government may try to not recognize the result of that election. But even, and I will conclude with this, but even if the government rigs the election, if you think for a moment in the pos at the possibility of the government being able to rig the election and come up with a result that does not represent the will of the people, it will be a major fundamental crisis for the regime. Because there is a fundamental difference between this moment and past elections, is that today, everybody in Venezuela, including Chavistas, know that they are a minority. Everybody knows now that they will lose an election a fair election. So if they see their own base of support, they see that they have won an election, they know, they will know that it was done through an ethical means. And it then it will make the regime face to his own people lose legitimacy. There were times in the past where even if the government was not really the majority they said they were, people could believe it. People who belong to the, to the official party, not today. Today it will be a confession of unfair and fraudulent gain. And that will create a crisis within the regime. That's why I'm saying that no matter what the result is, these elections will unleash forces in the Venezuelan political arena that will finally start, will help us start the transition to a new democratic system. Thank you.
Sí, 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 sí. ¿Qué pasa? ¿Qué pasa? ¿Qué pasa? ¿Qué pasa? ¿Y si? Tres minutos. ¿Y si? Ya la flor un poquito más te le va a faltar. Tres minutos. Tres minutos. Tres minutos. Tres minutos. Tres minutos. Thank you very much, uh, Jaime, for the invitation. It's good to be here with uh, Aníbal, Gustavo, and Herbert. It's good to see some uh, friends in the audience, too. Thanks for coming. Uh, I've been asked to, uh, to discuss uh, what the international community, including the OAS, can do uh, to improve the political situation in, in Venezuela, particularly in view of the... Uh, of the upcoming elections. So we, we just heard uh, how dramatic and depressing the political and economic situation is, so there's no need here to, to repeat it. So first, uh, let me uh, explain what I mean by uh, the international community. I'm thinking mostly of the, of the inter-American democratic community. That is, uh, the governments, the politicians, the uh, intellectuals, the media members, international bureaucrats, NGOs that are committed, that are committed to fundamental Republican representative uh, democratic uh, values and practices. Since the mid-80s, 1980s, uh, with the return of democracy to the hemisphere, uh, member states of this inter-American democratic community reached a fundamental consensus, a fundamental consensus and commitment to collectively, collectively defend and promote democracy in the hemisphere. Through the OAS, they developed several legal and diplomatic norms and instruments to that effect, culminating in 2001 with the signing of the Inter-American Democratic Charter. In this charter, significantly, uh, they, uh, they established that the peoples of the Americas have the right to democracy and the governments the obligation to exercise it and to defend it. The Charter also defines democracy as representative and it identifies its main principles and values including, of course, uh, the separation and independence of powers, uh, free and fair elections, respect for human rights, for minorities, and for fundamental freedoms, and others. Thus, uh, this inter-American democratic community has a set of norms and instruments to, uh, for the promotion and, and defense of democracy, which can be and should be used or applied whenever there is an alteration of democratic order in a member state. So how does Venezuela fit uh, in this inter-American in, in, in inter democratic community. As we just heard, uh, the Chavista regime is becoming increasingly authoritarian, to say the least. The Chavista regime and, the supporters claim that Ven and its supporters claim that Venezuela is a legitimate democracy, presumably, presumably because uh, the Chavistas have won uh, uh, elections regularly uh, for the past 15 years or so, no matter how questionable they are. But winning elections, as we know, without governing democratically, uh, uh, does not make a democracy. Since its radicalization and Cubanization, the Chavista regime has broken Venezuela's commitment to the Inter-American Democratic Charter and to the American Convention uh, uh, on Human Rights. To the disappointment of many, the Chavista regime has had the support of the so-called Bolivarian Alliance, including, of course, Bolivia, Ecuador, Nicaragua, <coughs> and some Caribbean countries belonging to uh, Petro Caribe. Plus, plus, the significant support, political and diplomatic support of Argentina, Brazil, and occasionally Uruguay. The Chavista Alliance this Chavista alliance has, has, has uh, essentially fragmented the inter-American uh, democratic community, as well as the OAS, and has basically paralyzed it. 
It, it has abused the principle of non-intervention to protect Venezuela from its criticism uh, of its violations, from criticism of its violations of, inter of the Inter-American Democratic Charter and the American Convention on Human Rights. The alliance has indeed prevented, has prevented any collective discussion of the political situation in Venezuela at the OAS. As for example, when Panama attempted to, uh, to have Maria Corina Machado speak at the Permanent Council, or as in, the, in this past August, August, when it voted down the, uh, to have a meeting of uh, foreign ministers uh, uh, on the Colombian-Venezuelan border crisis. Crisis, as you know, unleashed by the forced deportation of many <coughs> thousands of Venezuela, uh, Colombians living in Venezuela. And by the way, in addition to this border crisis, the regime has also rekindled uh, the border conflict with Guyana over the Esequibo territory. To divert attention from the political and economic crisis and to manipulate possibly the December elections. As current polls uh, give the opposition a wide lead. The regime aggressiveness is typical of dictatorships. Just rem <coughs> remember Galtieri in Argentina. So on, on the OAS front, Chavez and Maduro have, uh, have uh, dismissed and chastised the organization as useless, obsolete, anachronistic, and as an instrument of US imperialism. And they have accused the Inter-American uh, Human Rights Commission reports on human rights violations in Venezuela as a campaign against the country at the direction of the United States. In, 2000 and in, in 2012, Chavez even withdrew from the Inter-American Convention of Human Rights, on human rights. And the regime, as you know, probably, has, re has uh, rejected the OAS electoral observation, one of the most recognized and valuable instruments the organization has uh, for the promotion of democracy. <clears throat> Moreover, Chavez and Maduro have um, frequently accused, if not insulted, the OAS Secretary General Gaviria and OAS Secretary General Insulza mm, for interfering in Venezuela's internal affair, affairs. And recently, Maduro and his ex-foreign minister, uh, Elias Hawa, have called Secretary General Almagro a traitor and an enemy of Venezuela. The sad thing about this is that uh, most member states have not reacted to this, have not reacted to these attacks on the OAS, as though the OAS does not belong to them, as though they have not elected the Secretary General. So what to do? What should the Inter-American Democratic Community and the opposition in Venezuela do uh, to get Chavista, the Chavista regime to stop violating human and political rights to invite the OAS electoral observation mission, or to make sure that and to make sure that the elections are free and fair. There are several uh, do's and don'ts. Let me start with some don'ts first. First, do not ask, do not ask the OAS Secretary General to take action, or to send the electoral observation mission, or even call a meeting of the Permanent Council to discuss the situation in Venezuela, invoking the Inter-American Democratic Charter. The Secretary General does not have the independence or the power, uh, nor the power to do any of that without the request of Venezuela or the support of member states. He cannot even visit a country without, without, uh, without it, much less to send a mission. Of course, he can, uh, he can speak up. Of course, he, he may use the, uh, the power of the pulpit, but he cannot act alone. He needs the support, he needs the consent of, of Venezuela, in this, of the government of Venezuela in this case, and of other member states. Secondly, do not ask the OAS in the abstract hmm, to condemn or take actions against the regime. The, the organization is not an, a supranational organization. It's a, it, it is rather an intergovernmental organization, and as such, it cannot act independent of its members. Its performance depends on the state of relations 
among them. It works well when there is consensus, or at least uh, uh, when there is a winning majority of 18 members. So uh, uh, to apply the Inter-American Democratic Charter, one needs the, the consent or this winning majority. The same holds for UNASUR or CELAC. They perform on consensus. UNASUR, for example, could not meet uh, just recently, could not, could, not, could not hold a meeting on the Venezuelan-Colombian border crisis because there was no consensus for it. Now, let, let me suggest some do's. First, lobby presidents and foreign ministers of countries which do not sympathize with Venezuela, with the Chavista regime. This is where the pressure should begin. It is, uh, it is uh, the political leadership at this level that can or should initiate a process of challenging the Chavista regime and of building the necessary consensus and or the winning majority at the OIS to at least begin a, a, a collective assessment of the situation in, of, the, of, the, of the democratic erosion in, in Venezuela. It is they, it is they at this level who can and should instruct their ambassadors to the OAS to negotiate a collective pronouncement on Venezuela's uh, deteriorating democracy. Ambassadors will not act on their own they, without instructions. If they do, they will be fired. As a, as, as, as a friend of ours, uh, as has happened with a friend of ours. Second, talk to, the, to their legislative bodies and political parties and NGOs and, and the media. Ask them to pressure the regime to invite the OES electoral observation mission or the EU electoral observation mission. Ask them to free political prisoners, to stop harassing the opposition and the free independent media, and honor Venezuela's commitment to the Inter-American Democratic Charter. The Inter-American um, <coughs> Democratic Community should also provide technical and financial assistance to the opposition and relevant NGOs so that they can develop their own capacity to do uh, uh, domestic electoral observation. Hmm? <clears throat> to prevent fraud. Third, in countries whose government support the Chavista regime, do the same. Visit, uh, lobby, and pressure the democratic opposition leaders in those countries, such as national legislators or regional parliamentarians. Fourth, keep visiting and informing the OAS Human Rights Commission the UN human rights uh, bodies, and the EU Commissioner on Human Rights, as well as international NGOs such as, such as uh, uh, Human Rights Watch, and ask their officials to, to speak out against violations of human rights in Venezuela. Probably the most, uh, receptive, the most receptive environment to ask for support and action against the Chavista regime is obviously in the, uh, uh, the US government but be careful for what you wish for. Uh, any pronouncement or sanctions by the US government against the Chavista regime will likely elicit accusations uh, of interventionism and destabilization attempts. As, uh, and, and the opposition would likely be accused of treason. This is uh, basically what happened recently with uh, President Obama's executive order in March of this year. Uh, <clears throat> targeting those Chavistas responsible for violations of human and political rights and for significant public uh, uh, corruption. So, let me finish with a, uh, with a note uh, uh, of optimism, if, the, if one can have it. <laughs> fortunately, fortunately, there are some voices. There are some voices in Latin, within Latin America that are beginning to challenge the Chavista regime. Uh, uh, its violations of human rights uh, and, and its violations of the Inter-American Democratic Charter. The governments of Costa Rica, <laughs> Chile, Peru, and, and, and uh, Paraguay have recently expressed their concern 
for those violations, particularly after the incarceration of unjustified sentencing and incarceration of Leopoldo Lopez. Costa Rica, hmm, uh, at a recent permanent council meeting, even suggested directly to the Venezuelan ambassador and to the foreign minister that it should ask for OES uh, 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 electoral observation mission so that everybody will have a greater confi confidence in the electoral process. A remarkable challenge, actually, to the Chavista regime, unprecedented. In the same vein, the Chilean foreign minister has recently expressed its concern about the incarceration of Lopez and several, uh, several student leaders, but also, also indicated that, and this is significant, that expressing its concern cannot be considered an inter uh, interventionism in the internal affairs of Venezuela, and that the protection of human rights and political rights and basic freedom is everybody's business, is everybody's obligation. Furthermore, recently more than 30 ex-presidents signed a declaration in Bogota voicing their concern with the erosion of democratic uh, guarantees in Venezuela, expressing their solidarity with Leopoldo Lopez and other political prisoners, and calling for clean and transparent elections. Some of them should have done that uh, when they were in office. But <laughs> <laughs> Similarly, Chilean, Brazilian, Colombian, Paraguayan, Peruvian, and Uruguayan national legislators, as well as some members of the Mercosur Parliament, have objected to the sentencing of Lopez and have called for respect of human, right, human and political rights in Venezuela. And finally, even Secretary General Almagro recently gave the Chavistas a lecture on democracy in an open letter, in an open letter replying to Hawa's insulting letter. I only wish that the same voices would be raised about Cuban dictatorship. Hopefully, to finish, hopefully this resistance to the excesses and abuses of the Chavista regime, hopefully they will grow. And a renewed respect for democratic, republic, uh, republican values uh, and practices will soon predominate again uh, within the, uh, most of the nations of the hemisphere. Thank you for listening. And if you if you like to hear more about the uh, my critics my criticism of the OAS and the Chavista regime, I just got this book published, uh, so you can <laughs> you can look at it. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Selling at a discount today. <laughs> Okay. We have a uh, few minutes for questions and answers, and uh, I would very much appreciate that at the time you are recognized to please spell out who you are and uh, your affiliation. And we'll begin on the left. Even. Institute. Gentlemen, thank you all for excellent presentations, very informative. Um, I wanted to ask you if you would to perhaps speculate a little bit about the end game. Um, nothing can last forever. And so given this confluence of events, uh, Venezuela is running out of, of foreign exchange reserves, running out of basic goods, electoral angles are, 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 are narrowing. Um, there are, as, as we've uh, talked about, the increasing international consensus. Um, what do you see as the transition? Um, do, does, the, does this end in international conflict? Does this end in an electoral solution? Does this end in chaos and in, in disorder with a colectivo who's fighting a rearguard action against a new government in Caracas? How do you see this most likely to end, if I may ask? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One right behind. We'll accumulate a few, uh, few questions. Hello, my name is Martin Rodriguez. I'm in with Universidad Simón Bolívar and Cato Institute. My question would be, uh, there's a common future feature in your 
in the panel discussion and it, it refers to the transition. My question would be, first of all, I'm not so optimistic because of the revolutionary, revolutionary rev, I'm sorry, the revolutionary nature of the regime. That being, they would go all the way just to hand them, just to stay with power in their hands. How does the opposition can avoid engaging in appeasement in this new transition, and how do you embrace, uh, or how do you see this transition taking place? But especially, how does the opposition can avoid appeasement with the regime? Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, per Korovsky, I just wanted to ask the panel, imagine that the government had advanced their plans of increasing oil production to 5 million barrels per day. Would we have been better off today or not? Instead of the 2 million barrels, if we were currently producing 5 million barrels, would Venezuela be better off or not? un poco de estas preguntas. Muy bien, lo que está ahí. Take one more. There is that lady there. Okay, the gentleman here who uh, <laughs> with the pride from the microphone. Well, um, first and foremost, thank you to the Hudson Institute for putting together this great event and to the panelists for the great interventions. My name is Salim Daher. I'm from Valencia, Venezuela, currently a student at Florida International University and an intern for Congresswoman Ileana Ross Leighton. Uh, my question is that moving on from the elections of December 6, uh, in a hypothetical example that the, the opposition does manage to God willingly win the National Assembly majority, what would be the course of action to take starting the 5th of January? Would a constituent assembly be the way to go or perhaps a referendum? Or should the opposition just roll with the punches and just let the government sink in its own unpopularity? What do you think would be the course or the course of action to take? Thank you. Okay. One final question. Yes, sir. Yes, I'm Russell King, retired federal employee. I have a question about Venezuela's re relationship with Iran. Last week I saw the movie about uh, the Jewish Community Center bombing in Argentina, and after more than 20 years, the lead prose prosecutor died mysteriously last January. And then in the movie, it, it mentioned the fact that Chavez had a close relationship with Iran and may have influenced uh, Argentina politically. So I'm wondering how the opposition is going to change Venezuelan relationships with Iran. Thank you. Very interesting questions. I, I will specifically address the one raised by, uh, the one made by, uh, by Ivan Ellis about the end game, speculating on what may happen. A lot will depend on the results of the election and the attitude of the military. Uh, my view is that if, if the government loses the election badly, as, as, as may be the case, the government will try to, uh, not to recognize the opposition's victory. And I wouldn't be surprised I'm not forecasting that this is going to happen. I'm, I'm just mm, trying to uh, establish a, a, an analogy to what happened under Pinochet and the, and the, and the attitude of the uh, armed forces when he lost the referendum. I wouldn't be surprised if at, uh, important parts of the armed forces would ask Maduro to leave. I wouldn't be surprised if that happens. Um, 
this uh, and I and I foresee two stages in this end game. First stage would be a negotiated exit of Maduro and some of his closest allies, including some military officers. The expulsion of the Cuban uh, military and intelligence advisors from Venezuela. And a second stage would necessarily imply the suppression of the so-called collectivo, collectivos. This is inevitable uh, considering that the, uh, uh, the collectivos, these, these are organized, heavily armed bands created, supported, and stimulated by the government to intimidate the opposition and to uh, act violently against the opposition. Some of these groups have taken a life of their own and, 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 and have become a, a nuisance, and even more than that, to the government that created them. It, it would uh, be imperative for a new regime, a democratic constitutional regime in Venezuela to suppress these organized criminal bands and uh, only the uh, army can do the job. So in sum, a lot will depend the end game uh, as far as uh, one can foresee uh, these uh, complex events developing, uh, the end game will depend on two main variables. First, the result of the elections, and secondly, the attitude of the military. And I, I foresee two stages. First one, a negotiated uh, resignation or, or an exit of Maduro and some of his people the expulsion of the Cuban advisors, and finally the suppression of, of the collectivos and the establishment of, a, um, of, rule, uh, of, uh, of law and order. I, I, I see two, two main scenarios. One is uh, a violent scenario. The other one is a negotiation scenario. Uh, the negotiation scenario, in personally, worries me immensely. Uh, I have seen what happened in other countries where transitions, where uh, they left uh, a lot of uh, trash uh, below the rug. They, they didn't clean up the, the, the situation. And uh, by, by negotiating, you are actually almost inviting the, the losing side to come back within a certain amount of time. Uh, this is happening today in countries where the transition did not accomplish transitional justice, for example. We are now looking at the Colombian situation where the, the peace negotiations might leave out justice. And uh, it, it was a case in Chile where the military Pre, uh, retain privileges. Uh, it, it was a case in, in, in Poland. Uh, it was a case in Spain. And, and they, they all come back to, to hunt you after a while. So I am very worried about the negotiation scenario. But I think uh, it has a very good probability of being the, the, the winning one. Although the main enemy of the negotiation scenario is who are you going to negotiate with? Uh, the government uh, does not seem to have a unified uh, group uh, to negotiate with. Internally, they are very fragmented uh, between the Maduro group and, and the uh, Cabello group. Uh, maybe some, the, some of the military are having their own ideas, like uh, uh, Rodriguez Torres, uh, who is now uh, wanting to, to become the president as well. So that, that's a problem. Who do you negotiate with? But in the opposition, 
today there are plenty of uh, politicians wanting to do exactly that. Uh, now, the, the violent scenario, of course, is very worrying because of the violence. But I believe that, uh, unfortunately, if Venezuela is going to be a, a member of the civilized community in the future, it will have to redeem itself by standing up. We have been for many years, these last 16 years, humiliated, abused by this government. And uh, we, we, we cannot afford, if we don't want to lose this, our soul, we cannot afford to sit down and negotiate with these gangsters. And uh, I believe that some sort of a violent scenario uh, must be probably in the long term the better thing for Venezuela. Uh, just briefly, the five million barrels per day of per Kuroski. Well, uh, I think we would, we would be much worse off today <laughs> with five million barrels, but that's not the point. The point is that PDVSA has failed miserably as an oil company. That's the point. Now, what to do with the money? That's something else. And we know that this government has made a mess of it. But uh, uh, you're right, if we had five million uh, barrels of oil per day today, we, probably this, this government would be here for the next uh, 50 years. Thank you. Yeah, um, re regarding the first question about the end game, um, as I said before in my previous intervention, um, this is a government, this is a regime that will do whatever it takes and it can do to stay in power. Uh, so it will fight um, hard for it, and um, it, is, uh, it, it will depend on other factors that they will succeed or not uh, on, on being able to stay in power. Um, I think uh, the, the most likely scenario for me is in a scenario in which um, the opposition uh, defeats uh, the government in, the, in, in those elections, and instead of, of uh, member of, of the official party going now to Congress, uh, being part of, mino of minority, it will okay. trigger a collapse of the government. Um, th this is a regime that cannot withstand uh, a situation in which it has not control of all institutions. It is, it's a regime that has to um, govern the country um, in controlling all powers. So it will immediately, um, it's, it, and it's like markets, you know, uh, markets um, react in anticipation of what it sees coming. So um, the, the, the member of the regime will anticipate, could anticipate what could be uh, a country where the opposition now um, has majority or control Congress, and that will trigger the collapse of the regime, and this is where a, a negotiated solution uh, could take place or a chaotic collapse. Uh, this is why for me, um, these elections is not just uh, about replacement of, of, of um, people in Congress, but it's the, uh, the beginning of the end of the, en uh, of, of, of the, end of the government or, or the regimes, because as I said before, uh, it will be understood if the opposition wins and is able to, to um, to show uh, that has won, it will uh, signal for the regime that its end has started. Um, regarding um, another question um, about the transition, uh, I think that the transition will be very much depend on, uh, on what e exactly uh, the election triggers. If, the, if uh, we can be in a situation very soon in Venezuela where, as Aníbal uh, was suggesting, the president resigns, um, depending on, on the magnitude of those changes that are triggered by this election, the transition can be uh, limited to um, matters of, of the National Assembly, uh, of, mat of issues that uh, a new, of mem new members of Congress can can have a say on, can, can decide on, or go beyond that if it triggers a collapse, uh, as I'm, I'm saying that can happen of the entire government. Um, so the transition can be limited to issues of legis legislative nature or can go further. 
And regarding um, the question on on on, on Iran, um, I think uh, we effectively have seen uh, during this year um, a connection with uh, of the Venezuelan government with um, actors uh, from other regions of the world, uh, from the Middle East, uh, suspicious of uh, illegal activities, uh, like, for example, pro providing passport to um, um, terrorists or, 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 or actors that are <coughs> causing problems uh, all around the world. I think that w is one of the areas where um, Congress, a new Congress, uh, can act. Uh, in terms of demanding um, supervision, revision, analysis of, of how those units are operating. And if it is government, of course, uh, the, the power of action will be greater. But I think this is an, a, a critical area to act to. We have time for two more questions. One from the right and one from the left. Okay. No center. We are the center here. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Hello, uh, my name is Vanessa Zavala and I'm a graduate from the London School of Economics and International Development. Thank you very much for speaking. Uh, so my main concern is about the cannibalization of the Venezuelan society in itself. Uh, Mr. Romero, you mentioned that the opposition is unified and has an agenda, but the agenda seems to kind of try to digress everything that the Chavista government has done. Try to what? Uh, to digress it. So uh, addressing what the Chavista government has done and try to either bring it back to what it was um, or change it in a certain way, which in itself doesn't mean it's a bad thing, but to have that as the pure agenda is kind of um, going in, uh, against the, uh, the government. And instead of having an agenda of progress and looking beyond and understanding that the Chavista government has brought uh, a new culture and a new ideology in the country that even with the government leaving is not going to go away. Uh, so my concern is how can the Venezuelan society create dialogue to include all of the ideologies that have been created even from before or after the government so that there isn't this attack within the Venezuelan people uh, and that they can move forward together and not uh, in different portions. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Andrea Rodriguez. I am a Venezuelan journalist and currently work at the Organization of American States. Um, in my humble view, what Professor Perina stated uh, of the dues that uh, should be being made now uh, are already, some of them are already taking place without them being translated into actual um, tangible or short-term uh, changes. But my question is addressed to Mr. Torres uh, in the sense of it is undoubtedly that, uh, or at least for most of uh, Venezuelans, that the Chavista dream is dead, but how do you convince that other part of the population that actually believed in it, or that still believe in it, that the exit or that the solution is uh, in, the, uh, in, in the complete opposite side, given that they have been believing uh, in the same thing and they have been feeding with hope for the last 16, 17 years? Thank you. Um. Um, thank you for your question. I understand your concern. Um, but I think that ideology is too big a word to refer to what the Chavista message to the Venezuelan people has been and still is. I mean, what they, what they have provided the Venezuelan people with is a poisonous message of hatred polarization and disregard for the basic rules of democracy and a, a, a liberal society. It's going to be very difficult to restore a, a, a level of civilized coexistence 
in Venezuela in the coming months and years. I, I am sure that the immense majority of democratic Venezuelans have the best of intentions towards the other side, <laughs> if you want to put it like that, which is becoming a, a smaller as time goes by. Mm, but um, I couldn't uh, underestimate uh, the complexity of, of, of what lies ahead. The agenda, I, I, I said earlier, is uh, uh, directed towards restoring constitutional rule. Basic rules of the game, respect for human rights, liberation of political prisoners. That, that in itself is, is very, very important. Hey. Yeah. Um, yes. When I said that uh, the Venezuela, the Chavista dream, is is dead, um, I was referring to people who once uh, believed in that dream, and you can see it in the polls. So, for example, uh, last year was the first year I remember of uh, since Gallup uh, started um, polling in Venezuela systematically on uh, many diverse issues were uh, in, in many dif different questions that have to do with uh, confidence in national institutions, confidence uh, and in leadership of the country, country uh, confidence in the judicial system. In all those questions, a majority of Venezuelans uh, didn't believe in, were responding negatively. It was the first time, 2000 last year, 2014, um, and, 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 and by considerable margin. So what I'm saying is that f for many of those people who believe, uh, used to believe, in, in, in uh, had dreams, uh, hope um, about what that revolution entail, they themselves uh, now uh, don't believe it anymore. And you have other evidence. Uh, for example, if you look at Aporrea, you know, the, the main website, uh, you read their uh, articles so critical of the regime that they, they seem to have been written by someone from the, the opposition. They would be talking about the, um, uh, the, the disillusionment with the revolution, uh, that they are going through the most critical moment. I was reading this morning uh, one with that, that title. If you look at, for example, um, the protests and uh, in, invited the people uh, invited to take to the street by the government, that enthusiasm, that uh, number of people are not there anymore. So uh, I think there are many signs of different uh, types that uh, that dream is, is no longer there. Uh, now, it doesn't translate uh, completely 100% into support for the opposition. That, that's another thing. But clearly, and according to the poll, a significantly uh, larger number of people um, are at this point supporting the opposition vis-a-vis -vis the, government, the government. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes. Hmm? Yeah. I, I just wanted to leave you uh, uh, with the idea uh, which I find critical to, to the whole Venezuelan situation, and that's that the poverty in Venezuela is the same as it was 16 years ago. The levels of poverty in Venezuela after 2.4 trillion or worse. I mean, I just want to leave this with you because uh, the, the bulk of the prestige and the mystique and the myth and the religion of Chavez is entirely based on the fact that he took millions of Venezuelans out of poverty when in fact all he was doing was giving money to Venezuelans, but not uh, making it possible for Venezuelans to escape poverty structurally. Giving money, in fact, uh, made them become even more dependent on the paternalistic state. And today we are seeing the same levels of poverty and a bunch of Venezuelans who feel betrayed 
by, by this paternalistic uh, government. I wanted to leave this idea with you because at the end of the, uh, of the day, this is what counts in a nation, whether the nation can become, uh, the citizens can, can escape poverty structurally. Well, time has arrived, and uh, I would like very much to thank you for having attended our, our conference this afternoon. And uh, I would ask you a final round of applause for our esteemed panel.